Hi everybody, in this video, we are going to do three free response questions based on the topic of electrons. So let me write that in electrons. Oh, I spelled it wrong. There you go. So let's take a look at the very first question, which comes from the chemistry Olympiad. So it's going to be a little bit complicated, but we could do this. So how much energy is lost as heat? when a photon with a wavelength of 454 nanometers is absorbed by HPTS and a photon with wavelength of 520 nanometers is emitted. So, notice how this question is oddly worded and there's something called heat that's being talked about. So let's think about what this question is talking about. So, it's saying that this substance called HPTS is absorbing a photon with a wavelength of 454 nanometers and it's emitting a photon with 520 nanometers and if you might notice things with a higher wavelength have a lower energy so this has a higher energy and this has a lower energy so it's saying that when it absorbed one photon and then out came the same photon it said that the photon actually lost energy because at the beginning it had more energy but afterwards it has less energy so this photon obviously has gone through some tough times and it probably lost its energy in the form of heat as said by the question so we have to determine how much heat was lost by this photon and it's not really the same exact photon i'm just doing it for simplicity but it's just one photon going in and one photon going out with a different amount of energy. And that energy that was lost was lost as heat. So let's do this question and let's see how it goes. So we concluded for this question that the change in energy, or you could even call this heat, is equal to the energy after minus the initial energy. And this is for just one photon. So, knowing this, let's figure it out. So let's find the energy for each of these photons in order to find EF and EI, or the final energy, which is that, and the initial energy of the photon, which is that. So, let's get to it. The first wavelength, which is the initial energy state, um has a wavelength of 454 nanometers. And converting that to meters, we get 454 times 10 to the negative nine meters. Now, let's calculate the energy for this photon. So the energy for this photon, well, we had to first find the frequency. So we know that C equals HV. So, oops, why did I write that eight? Okay. 3.00 times 10 to the 8 is equal to um, lambda, which is 454 times 10 to the negative 9 meters, because we have to use meters in this equation, times V. So doing plug and chug, let's see what we get for V. So 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 454 times 10 to the negative 9, put parentheses around 454 times 10 to the negative 9, we get that the frequency is 6.61 times, no, actually, let's keep one sig fig, so 6.608 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Now, we can use this to find the energy for that photon. So, the energy is equal to um, H, which is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 times the V, which is over here. I'm not going to write it because it's right there. And we get that E is equal to 4.38 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So let's now do the same exact thing, but instead of doing it for the initial photon that went in, let's do it for the photon that was emitted. I did some erasing, and now let's do it for the photon that went out. So the photon that went out has a wavelength of 520 nanometers. Note this is two sig figs and not three. So doing the math, we get that it's five point... No, actually, actually, let's just do 520 times 10 to the negative nine meters. 
So after this, we have to, of course, convert wavelength to frequency. So 3.00 times 10 to the 8 is equal to this number over here times the frequency. And doing the math, we get that 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 520 times 10 to the negative 9. You get that the wavelength, or I mean the frequency, sorry, is equal to 5.77 times 10 to the 14. And then you multiply V times Planck's constant 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34. And this is equal to the energy for one photon. And doing the math, it's 5.77 times 10 to the 14 times 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34, we get that the energy for the second photon that got released, which is the final energy state, this is going to be equal to 3.8 times 10 to the negative 19. So looking at this, we can figure out some things. We know that EF minus EI will be the change in energy which is the same thing as heat. So let's do the final energy state minus the initial energy state. So the E final is going to be 3.8 times 10 to the negative 19. And this will be subtracted by EI, which is 4.38 times 10 to the negative 19. So if you're wondering how you do sig figs in this case, well, there is a neat little trick. You see how both of these have 10 to the negative 19? Well, you could easily factor that out. 10 to the negative 19 times 3.8 minus 4.38. And doing the math, you get that 3.8 minus 4.38 is going to be 0, negative 0 0.58. But since there's one decimal place, it's going to be negative 0 0.6. And then, of course, it's going to be multiplied by 10 to the negative 19. So this is in joules, I believe, because these two were both in joules. So we have to convert this to scientific notation since it'll look nicer that way. So if we move this decimal place once there, we get negative six times 10 to the negative 20 as our change in energy. And note this is in joules. So the change in energy apparently is going to be negative 6 times 10 to the negative 20 joules. And remember, this is a change in energy. So since this number is negative, that means that there was a loss in energy, and this lost energy was lost as heat. So our answer for the amount of heat that was lost would be 6 times 10 to the negative 20 joules for every one proton absorbed and emitted. So notice how it's a positive number since if you're losing something, that something has to be positive. But overall, when you're losing something, the change in energy is negative. So the change in energy is negative, but the energy lost as heat is a positive number. Because if you think about it, losing 6 times 10 to the negative 20 joules of energy is the same thing as saying that the change in energy for the photon going in and out is negative 6 times 10 to the negative 20 joules. So they mean the same thing, but this would officially be the right answer. Now let's move on to the second question. The complete photoelectron spectrum of an element is in its ground state and it's represented below. So remember, for photoelectron spectrums, this would be 2, and since this is 3 times as much, we can assume that 2, 1 to 6, and in between would be 4. So write the ground state electron configuration for the element. Now remember, the highest binding energy is the orbital in the lowest principal energy level, so it would be the 1s2 sublevel because the binding energy is the ionization energy, and the ionization energy per electron is actually highest for the orbitals that are closest to the nucleus, and the orbitals closest to the nucleus, well, the very first one would be 1s2. And as you move toward the right, the ionization energy decreases, so that means these electrons are further from the nucleus, so they have a lower ionization energy. So this would 
be in order in terms of, you know, the energy levels of the orbitals, since if an orbital has higher energy, then that means it takes less energy to remove it, since, you know, if it's at higher energy, it's generally located further away, and that means it takes less energy to remove those electrons that are located further away. So, if that's 1s2, then this is 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and this would be 4s2. Notice how this is going in order of the electron staircase. And then we look at A1. Write the ground state electron configuration for the element. So this would correspond to video, I think, 4.3. And this would correspond to video 4.5. And for B, this would correspond to video 4.1. So for A1, the ground state electron configuration of the element would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. And that's the answer for A1. Now, A2, we have to identify the element that has this electron configuration. So I think the element would be calcium, since calcium has the same electron configuration as the one shown above. And an easy way to do this would be to count the number of electrons here, and since an atom is an element, then the number of protons and electrons are the same in an element. So if this had 20 electrons, then the element would of course have 20 protons, and the element with 20 protons would be calcium. So now 2b is going to require some math. It says to calculate the wavelength and meters of electromagnetic radiation needed to remove an electron from the valence shell of an atom of the element. So which one of these is the valence shell? Well, it's the one that has the lowest ionization energy since the valence electrons are the ones that are farthest from the nucleus and these would be the 4s electrons. So the 4s electrons will be our valence electrons and saying how much energy or what is the wavelength of the electromagnetic energy needed to remove the electron from the 4s2 shell. So how much energy does it take to remove one electron? Well, it says the binding energy or the ionization energy per electron is this number. So it takes that much energy from the photon to release an electron that's in the 4s2 sublevel. So we have to find a wavelength for a proton that corresponds to this energy. So let's do that on the next slide. 0 0.980 times 10 to the negative 18, and I think this is in joules, so in joules. And yeah, it says in joules right there if you erase the marks. So this is the energy that photon needs to release a valence electron from the atom calcium. So this number is equal to Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to negative 34, times the frequency. And doing the math, 0 0.980 times 10 to the negative 18, divided by parentheses, 6.626. 626 times 10 to the negative 34, we get that the frequency for this photon will be 1.48 times 10 to the negative, oh, I mean not negative, 10 to the 15 hertz. And you need to find the wavelength. So C equals lambda V, so 3.00 times 10 to the 8 is equal to lambda, our wavelength, times the frequency, which is 1.48, times 10 to the 15. So doing the math, 3 times 10 to the 8, divided by the frequency will be 0 0.0000003 meters, and that's our wavelength. So we want this in meters, so that could be our answer, or we could do in scientific notation. 2.03 times 10 to the, let's see how many times we move it back. Well, no, the decimal place is over here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So 10 to the negative 7 meters. And this would be our official answer for this question. So let's move on to the very next question.
Now this question's a little bit interesting. The bond enthalpy for an oxygen-oxygen double bond, or the energy it takes to break a mole of bond, so that's what bond enthalpy means, is 495 kilojoules per mole. Calculate the minimum wavelength of light required to break the oxygen-oxygen double bond in O2. Now we have to assume that one photon breaks one bond, so that's a clue. Now identify the type of electromagnetic energy the light is using the electromagnetic spectrum above. So this over here will help us out. So on the next page, we write the bond enthalpy, which is 495 kilojoules per mole. And this is a mole of oxygen-oxygen double bonds. So it says it takes this much energy to break a mole of these type of bonds. But we want to know how much energy it takes to break one oxygen-oxygen double bond so we could find how much energy a photon needs to break exactly one oxygen-oxygen double bond since one photon breaks one oxygen-oxygen double bond. So let's find the amount of energy it takes to break one OO double bond. So how do we do this? Well, let's erase the equal sign. We know that a mole of, you know, oxygen oxygen double bonds has 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of these things so doing the math we get that well 495 divided by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd we get that it takes 8.22 times 10 to the negative 22 kilojoules to break one oxygen oxygen double bond but we want this in joules since our E equals HV equation will require joules. So converting this to joules, we get 8.22 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And this is the energy it takes to break one oxygen-oxygen double bond. So if this is the amount of energy it takes to break one bond, this is the amount of energy that that photon needs to break the bond, since all the energy in the photon will be absorbed by this bond and it will break it if it has enough energy. So the photon needs this much energy to break this. So let's find the energy of the photon, which is this, and correlate it to the frequency. So 8.22, I think that's right, times 10 to the negative 19 joules is the energy we need the photon to have. And this is equal to Planck's constant. Uh, oops, I read that wrong. 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 times the frequency. And doing the math, we get, well, let's do the math and see what we get. So I got that the frequency is 1.24 times 10 to the 15 hertz. UC equals lambda V. And we get 3.00 times 10 to the 8 is equal to lambda times V, which is 1.24 times 10 to the 15 do the math and let's see what lambda is. 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by our frequency and we get that the wavelength is 2.42 times 10 to the, let me count the decimals, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 10 to the negative 7 meters and that is the answer for, well, the first part. Now we have to find the second part. So it says that identify the type of electromagnetic energy the light is. So this light has a wavelength of 2.42 times 10 to the negative 7. So looking at the chart, which type of electromagnetic energy corresponds to this wavelength? So 10 to the negative 7 is actually in between 10 to the negative 8 and 10 to the negative 6. So it looks like it'll hit the UV region. So this type of light will be a UV light. So let me write that. And this topic correlates closely to what's happening in our atmosphere. So in our atmosphere, there are a lot of oxygen molecules, of course. And the sun, which is, you know, the yellow sun that's right above us, the sun actually emits UV rays. And these UV rays are able to break these oxygen-oxygen double bonds. And when they're broken, the oxygen becomes alone. And, you know, another oxygen molecule comes along and snatches this guy. And you end up creating something called ozone, which has a 
structure that looks like this. So we'll learn how to draw the structures in the future, but for now, just know that these calculations that we're doing actually have an application, and we kind of just proved why UV lights from the sun are able to break oxygen-oxygen double bonds, and as a result, that's why we have naturally occurring ozone in our atmosphere. So that's all for this video. I hope you learned a lot, and have a nice day.